Over the last week, I've been in contact regularly with First Nations leadership in those provinces. Tonight, First Nations in Alberta and Saskatchewan will see federal money to help fight a surge of COVID cases. People assume that I know everything about COVID-19 and I get asked on the streets. Translating pandemic information to a Nututut for all of Nunavut. A lot of Métis students are still kind of reconnecting with their Métis identity, so I really like that that, that is part of the program. And the Manitoba Métis Federation is helping students through a scholarship program. Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson. With COVID-19 cases spiking out of control over the country, the government offered help for Indigenous communities and gave an update on predictions for the near future. As Jamie Pashagumskin reports, according to the Prime Minister, it looks grim. We all want to try and have as normal a Christmas as possible, even though a normal Christmas is, quite frankly, right out of the question. The Prime Minister said, at the current rate, by the end of December, Canada could have 20,000 new cases daily of COVID-19. And he announced help for regions hit hard. Today, we're providing over $120 million in immediate funding to regions that are affected by outbreaks in Saskatchewan and Alberta. This will be used to support public health measures, food security, and other surge capacity needs. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller said the money will help fight the rocketing cases of COVID-19 in First Nations in Alberta and Saskatchewan. He said there are currently 662 active cases in those two provinces. Over the last week, I've been in contact regularly with First Nations leadership in those provinces, and they've been specific about what is required to protect their members and communities. The measures we're announcing today are in direct response to their requests. Trudeau said he will not call for another national lockdown, but it's up to people to follow COVID protocols. We need to hang in there. We need to know that the end is in sight, but we're not there yet. We still got to get over this hump of a winter that's going to drive us inside, endanger us to more spikes and more transmission, and really hang in there. Miller was asked about a request for military aid by the Opasquiac Cree Nation. The northern Manitoba community is dealing with a large outbreak. The minister said the scope and level of involvement is being finalized. Jamie Pashagumska, APTN National News, Ottawa. The B.C. government announced they are putting in even stricter measures in an effort to combat the rising numbers of COVID-19 cases in the province. Effective immediately, masks are mandatory in all indoor spaces, including retail shops and workplaces. Spin classes, hot yoga classes and high interval training programs have been shut down. All non-essential travel is restricted province-wide and in-person face-based gatherings are prohibited. Gatherings inside households with people not in core bubbles are also banned. As we approach the darkest days of this year, there is light at the end of that tunnel. We know that there's vaccines on the horizon, and I am hopeful that early in the new year, we'll start to have some of those tools to help us protect those who are most at risk. But right now, we all need to focus our efforts on slowing the spread and bending our curve back down. And we want to hear what you think about restrictions in your territory. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube to share your comments. On Thursday, APTN reported on a coalition of Black and Indigenous activists. They were going to shut down a busy Ottawa intersection for 24 hours. Well, the 24 hours are long over and they aren't budging. Demonstrators remain camped out at the corner of Laurier Avenue and Nicollet Street. They plan to remain here for another night. They have a list of 10 demands they want Ottawa City Hall to meet. One of them is for police to leave contested Indigenous territories. Yesterday there was a tense moment when a vehicle ran through the blockade. Today's spokesman Jace House said they've heard nothing from the city so far and would not say when they're leaving. 
Cynthia Parisian has been missing since February 2019 and was last seen leaving a Winnipeg Home Depot. Today, Winnipeg police released new details they hope will lead to information about her whereabouts. Daryl Stranger has more. It's been 20 months since Cynthia Parisian was last seen leaving a Home Depot on Leela Avenue in Winnipeg in February of 2019. Winnipeg police released new surveillance video Friday morning showing Cynthia leaving the store. She then appears to enter a dark colored truck. Police believe this truck may be an important detail in her disappearance. The truck was in the parking lot for a significant amount of time, uh, so it would appear to us that it was perhaps waiting for her. Um, and just the fact that it meets up with her, appears to meet up with her, uh, we believe she entered that truck. Um, and so what we're doing today is reaching out to potentially who was in that truck. Uh, did you pick Cynthia up? Did you provide her with a ride? Uh, we would like to speak to you. At the time of her disappearance, Cynthia had been wearing dark clothing with a pink toque. She is described as indigenous, approximately 5 foot 3 inches in height, with a heavy build with brown hair and brown eyes. Cynthia's family renewed the call for help from the public after the release of the video. She has a family that loves her and are missing her. And she also has a grandson that was born after she's disappeared, um, that she's never met. We believe that someone has information on her disappearance. We just want some, some answers and anything at this point would help. Anyone with information is asked to call Winnipeg Police or Crime Stoppers. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. For the second time in two months, the Innu community of Wahat Makmani Utdam in Quebec's Côte Nord rallied at the last minute to stop an apprehension by Youth Protection Services thanks to a Facebook tip. It happened earlier this week in Wahat, 900 kilometers northeast of Montreal. Residents held a vigil outside the house in question for over two hours, negotiating with social workers. The children were ultimately placed together in another home within the community. The same outcome as an intervention held in late September. The EMU say they'll continue running interference because Quebec's current system is abusive. Abuser de toutes sortes de manières, que ce soit dans l'évaluation de la capacité d'être famille d'accueil et accueillir les enfants, on demande toujours trop de, de, de critères justement pour que la DPJ nous reconnaisse comme ayant la capacité d'assumer la garde. Et dans la période d'évaluation et orientation de ces interventions, la DPJ euh, décide de manière unilatérale les orientations euh, de nos enfants. Effective immediately, police in Alberta were, will no longer be able to card members of the public. Carding is the practice of randomly obtaining personal information from members of the public, even if there is no suspicion of wrongdoing. For years, critics have called carding racist, as it tends to target minorities. Alberta's Justice Minister said it's being banned because it's an inappropriate use of police power. But Siksika Nation Councillor Samuel Crowfoot says the move was long overdue and he questions the motives behind the decision. Are we supposed to express gratitude to the police for committing to no longer violate our rights? In the age of rallying cries like Black Lives Matter and defund the police, I can't help but wonder what is really driving this announcement. Is it integrity? Is it a change of heart? Or maybe, finally, it is the spirit of reconciliation taking form. Or is this a PR stunt designed at preemptive damage control? Time for a quick break, but when we come back, we meet the Anuk woman relaying important pandemic information to Nunavumiet. When I speak Nukit, it's generally longer than the English, so I explain it out and make sure that it's understood by the elders and by Unilingwini. With 10 new cases today, Nunavut now has 84 positive cases of COVID-19. 
Nunavut have been tuning in territory-wide to hear what their top doctor and politicians have to say since March. Today in the final part of our perspectives on Nunavut's COVID-19 fight, Kent Driscoll introduces us to the Inuk woman responsible for making sure Inuktitut speakers get vital health information in their first language. This from Iqaluit. On the left, that's Mike. On the right, that's Uli. Dr. Michael Patterson is Nunavut's chief public health officer. Ulipika Ikidluak is an interpreter with over 30 years experience. Whatever Patterson says, she interprets into a nuptitude for the people watching at home. For those people at home, even the bilingual ones, this is a big deal. First language matters, and when it comes to health, even more so. When, when Ulipika tells, translates whatever in, in a nuptitude, we, we, I, for me anyway, I just, okay, I get it now, I get it. And, you know, I, I would have missed a lot if I just listened to the English version, but it, it, he's been amazing in finding, seems like new words for COVID and different sicknesses or different things that you do to avoid uh, COVID. She has been vital because we have a lot of unilingual Inuit in Nunavut and she's a very in good interpreter and she interprets very well and get the messaging out that uh, if, if you have a unilingual person giving the message out then she, she has to be there to give the, the Inuit, uh, not just the Inuit language but the Inuit's perspective. According to the Premier, that perspective matters. A simple turn of phrase in English can be tough in Inuktitut. How do you interpret planking the curve into Inuktitut? At times there's not words that, uh, an Inuktitut word for a certain uh, English word, and she has to literally make it or explain it, and I do that a lot. If I do, you might have noticed when I speak in it's generally longer than the English, so I explain it out and make sure that it's understood by the elders and by unilingual English. George Hicks was health minister until just a few weeks ago. He doesn't speak in Uktitu, so he relies heavily on interpretation. Uh, and Uli's uh, interpretation skills are you know, second to none for one, uh, but just to get the right tech technical terms, uh, overlapping the dialectal differences to making sure that the, that the message is getting out. To, the government has been doing multiple briefings a week, and they're carried live throughout Nunavut. An unexpected side effect? A kid is famous now. Yes, people assume that I know everything about COVID-19, and I get asked on the streets. She's used to being behind the scenes. This level of attention is brand new for her. Uh, it's been an, ad an adjustment. Um, I was nervous at first, but it's coming naturally to me now. Look at the concentration. A Kidluak writes down every word spoken and then says it back in a nuktitut, live on TV. Uh, it is hard. Some of them speak fast, so it takes a lot to keep up to, to say or to write what they're saying and then say it all afterwards. And sometimes she has to crack the whip on someone. Correct. And, Wait. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. So it's it's been a been a learning curve, and yeah, there have been times as more so earlier on where I would you know I get a complicated question and it really needs a five minute answer, but picking points to stop and let her interpret so she doesn't get lost, like where it's not recorded and not written down, I need to chunk it up into pieces that she can remember and interpret accurately and then carry on from there so that's hard um, and, and there's no school for that so that's been a figuring it out as we uh, as we go kind of thing while sometimes she has to rein in the people answering the questions according to a kid walk the people asking the questions are a much bigger hassle I've seen it. yeah they go all over the place sometimes and I've had to keep them in line to get straight to the question she keeps us in line, she keeps the government in line, and she keeps Nunavut informed. And now, she's one of the best known people in Nunavut. And as COVID continues to make way in Nunavut, she'll make sure Inuit know what's happening. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Echelwit. Time now for our last quick break.
Métis students get a financial boost thanks to the Manitoba Métis Federation. This additional assistance from the MMF just just makes you know me feel like I'm going to be able to make it through the end of this this education program. So. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. David Bowers seen here with a rescued bear cub and his loyal friend Maple Syrup. The cub was raised and restored to good health before being reintroduced to the wild. Now we don't recommend raising a bear, but thanks to David Bowers for the picture and the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario for helping save that little bear. You too can se send your photos to share at eptn.ca and maybe your picture will be our picture of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Here is tomorrow's weather forecast starting on the east coast. 13 above in Halifax, 10 degrees in Fredericton, minus 3 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus 6 in Cloud and La Grande River, 1 above in Montreal, minus 1 in Gasp, 6 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud in Toronto, London, Sarnia and Windsor, minus 2 in Thunder Bay, 4 below in Sioux Lookout in northern Manitoba, minus 11 in Puckatawagan and Thompson, a little bit of sun and 0 in Winnipeg and Dauphin, in Saskatchewan, minus 1 in snow in Regina, minus 1 in Swift Current, and minus 9 in La Range, Buffalo Narrows. In northern Alberta, sunny skies and minus 15 in high level, minus 9 in Grand Prairie, some sun and minus 2 in Edmonton, 4 above in Lethbridge. On the west coast, 7 degrees and some sun in Penticton, 9 above in Victoria, 0 degrees in Smithers, 10 above in Sand Spit, Minus 25 in Beaver Creek, 16 in sunny skies, minus 16 in sunny skies in Rock River. In the NWT, a chilly minus 22 in Fort Simpson, minus 21 in Trout Lake, minus 20 in Fort McPherson, minus 14 in Colwell Lake. In Nunavut, minus 18 in Whale Cove with some snow, minus 16 in Arviat, minus 11 in King Knight. Minus 15 with a mix of sun and cloud in Clyde River. The Manitoba Métis Federation will be distributing over $4 million to students this week to alleviate the financial burden many students face. The money will be going to over 1,000 students as part of the Federation's post-secondary education support program. Our Daryl Stranger has more. This is uh, some dollars that are there to help them just go through this so that they can focus on their education and complete and fulfill their dream instead of worrying about their bank account. Easing the minds of students is the focus of the latest funding given to students by the Manitoba Métis Federation. The post-secondary education support program is part of a 10-year post-secondary education accord between the federal government and the MMF. This is the second year of the Accord and there are two programs Métis students can apply to for financial aid. One for educational related support and another for those who cannot find work due to COVID-19. It is um, designated for post-secondary education. So they have to be enrolled in there and um, we have uh, two separate applications. We have one application that's um, for the post-secondary education for university college. And then we have the COVID dollars uh, where we're giving the additional supports to our Métis students. Josh Swain is in his fifth and final year as a full-time student at the University of Winnipeg. He turned down an offer to work at his previous job to focus on school. Not having to worry about paying bills allows him to focus on finishing his degree. I really, really wanted to focus on my education this final year and just make sure my grades stayed up. So I ended up declining going back to work. So. You know, um, that made me ineligible for any government benefits, which I knew would happen. Um, so this additional assistance from the MMF just 
just makes you know me feel like I'm going to be able to make it through the end of this this education program. So. Along with the funding, students are able to participate in a free educational program put on by the MMF to learn about Métis people and culture. It's kind of like a three-part. It's talking about um, the history of the Métis people um, and then giving also a, a bit of a, a background on what Métis culture is. Because um, then I know a lot of students, um, a lot of Métis students are still kind of reconnecting with their Métis identity. So I really like that that, that is part of the program. As of November 19th, 800 students applied for educational funding and an additional 250 students applied for COVID-19 relief funding. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. A woman imprisoned for more than two decades says she should be free. After a brutal murder in 1993, three people were sent to jail, but they all say only one of them did it. John Murray joins us from Edmonton to tell us about this week's episode of APTN Investigates, A Life Sentence. Thanks for joining us today, John. The story is about a crime that happened more than 25 years ago. Why is it coming to light now? Well, you know, it's important to say that the, the two women involved have always maintained their innocence. They pled not guilty at the trial. Um, they exercised all their courses of appeal. And the young offender that was involved, he pled guilty and he owned his role in it all along. Now, it kind of sat stagnant for a while, but through the work of advocates and the, the sister's family, they came together and they started to, to, to look for more help. And they ended up getting some lawyers on board and they brought on Innocence Canada and David Milgard came on board and he started to advocate for these sisters. And now this seems to have built up some momentum and it's starting to snowball and it looks like some good things are going to be happening for these sisters. As you mentioned, one of the three people convicted was a young offender at the time. Why did he come forward? Well, like I said, he, he always owned up to the crime. He pled guilty to it, but, uh, you know, he, he did his time, and he, he, he's, he's a full-grown man. You know, this was 25 years ago. He served on council on his reserve. He's done a lot of things. But one of the things, this, is, this is, seems to have weighed on him. And through the work of family members, um, uh, Zerlina, the sister of Odelia and Nerissa, and uh, Odelia's husband, Jay Cook, uh, they, they, they started to... Uh, you know, it, it, it make an impassioned uh, request to this man, man to come forward, and he finally did. And I think it was weighing on him. He he had uh, had heartfelt conversations with his father and and with these cousins as well. So I think he just felt it was time to come forward. All right. Thank you, John. Looking forward to seeing that episode tonight. All right. Well, thank you, Chat. A Life Sentence on APTN Investigates airs right after tonight's APTN National News. And that's all your, your news for this Friday, November 20th. We'll be back here tomorrow for your APTN National News Weekend Edition. You can also find us online at APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now TikTok. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a great evening. And remember to stick around for APTN Investigates coming up next.